Cambridge Muslim College, training the next generation of Muslim thinkers. Most really of what I'm going to be saying relates, I think, very closely to the issues that Mark Harris was uh, talking about. And I suppose we come, uh, for, for this topic, we come from the point which all of us know, which is there's a huge amount of excitement about AI at the moment. You can't turn on the television, you can't open a newspaper without turn on YouTube, whatever, without finding some uh, remark about AI, usually very excited, very often full of hype. Um, so there's a lot of excitement about AI at the moment. And why is that? Well, I mean, in, to put it very, very briefly, I think the reason is that over the past um, five, ten years, we've come to a stage now where there are increasing numbers of interesting, intriguing, useful, and for certain people, highly lucrative uh, AI gizmos. We're surrounded by them, and that's what all the hype, well, much of what all the hype is about in the newspapers and the why the businessmen are getting excited and so on. Now, I think that the most exciting thing about AI, and particularly in this context, is not the gizmos. It's what I call the ghost. In other words, it's the mind, or rather, AI's view of the mind, how AI helps us to think about the mind, that is what I think, that's what I've always thought is most interesting um, about AI. Um, and of course, the reason I use the word ghost, you'll think of Gil Gilbert's Ryle talk about the ghost in the machine. Now, of course, when Ryle talked about the ghost in the machine, uh, he meant to be criticizing a particular view of the mind uh, which did see it as some sort of supernatural, utterly mysterious, uh, completely beyond science, uh, substance, stuff, thing, phenomenon, whatever word you want to use, um, which certainly wasn't the same thing as the brain. Uh, and indeed, its relationship to the brain was very, very unclear. I don't just mean, you know, didn't understand the details, that there could be any sort of relationship between that view of the mind, the Cartesian view, if you like, um, and the brain was fundamentally mysterious from the metaphysical point of view. And um, Gilbert Rowell had no patience with that, and uh, so his talk about the mind being the ghost in the machine was intended to be a very uncomplimentary interpretation of the notion of a ghost. And when I say that what's uh, exciting and relevant for our purposes uh, about AI uh, is its view of the ghost, I'm not using that in an uncomplimentary way, um, as, as we'll see later. Uh, I think you can say that AI sees the mind, if you like, as a ghost in this sense, that it doesn't see the mind as a physical um, mechanism. It doesn't see the mind as the brain. It doesn't actually say, well, at least some do, but I think properly interpreted, and uh, uh, Ron... Uh, Grizzly may be talking about this a bit tomorrow. I think that properly interpreted, it doesn't say what Dennett says, and Mark Harris actually quoted, I think it was Mark, or perhaps it was the Sheikh uh, who gave the first talk, quoted Dennett as saying, our thoughts um, are part events in our brain, um, which are information processing events, now, actually, I think it's, um, you don't have to say, and AI doesn't force you to say, um, that our, our thoughts are events in the brain. They are information processing phenomena which are implemented in the brain. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll come to that. You don't worry about that. So the, what I'm trying to say is the term ghost here is not meant to be 
a scornful interpretation of ghost, but it certainly is meant to um, underline the point that Ryle was trying to make, and Descartes in his own way, that in some sense, the mind is not the brain. It isn't a different uh, type of phenomenon, different way of looking, thing, looking at things, and we'll come to that. Um, now, if you uh, ask the question, the sorts of questions that Mark Harris was asking about science and religion and their relationships and so forth, I think it's uh, fair to say that a key source for both science and religion is a sense of wonder at the world around us. Um, at microscopic levels and at cosmic levels. We've seen some pictures already this morning. So wonder is a very important source of both sorts of worldview. But science also um, aims, and crucially, aims at understanding. And what I'm, an explanatory sort of understanding. You might say, well, wisdom is a, is a sort of understanding. Well, the sort of understanding which science, the natural sciences are aiming for is explanatory understanding, uh, not, not wisdom, not uh, knowledge of how to live and the ethical issues and so forth. Um, and wonder and understanding aren't the same sorts of... Uh, Thing. And many people think, assume, um, that understanding drives out wonder. If you have understanding of the explanatory sort, it must leave no room for wonder. And I think that's one of the sources of the assumption, again, which Mark Harris talked about, uh, that's so widespread that there is this fundamental an inescapable conflict between science and religion. Because if science is looking for understanding and you've got understanding, um, then there's no room for wonder anymore. And that is sometimes true. I, I mean, a lovely example of it that uh, I, I, I was told about, I remember years ago, by um, Oliver Selfridge. Now, Oliver Selfridge, uh, I suppose you could say, you may well have heard of him, you've certainly heard his name, Selfridge, and indeed he was the grandson of the man who founded Selfridges. Uh, so you've heard of him that way. But if you know anything about the history of AI, you will also have heard of him, and you will, realize, you will know that he was in fact one of the very, very earliest and most important and most influential people working in AI. And his ideas about, um, in, in both symbolic AI and connectionist processing, parallel processing, are still um, very influential. Uh, and, for example, they, they underlie a lot of the thinking in um, what I think is the most interesting computer AI model of consciousness, the leader model, which again, Ron may or may not be talking about. But anyway, he's a very important person in this uh, area. But he told me a story once, it's just a personal anecdote. Um, and I forget the context in which, he wasn't making a moral, he just told me this story, um, which I think actually is very relevant. He said when he was a child, a young child, I don't know, seven maybe, I don't know, six, seven, that sort of thing, um, he became fascinated, or he ended up, I should say, as a professional engineer, that was it. Uh, he became fascinated by round things, circles. So he would collect uh, bottles, glasses, tops of bottles, all different sizes, and so he would take these to this glass and he would get his pencil and he would draw the circle for the bottom of the glass. And then he'd do the same for this, which of course is a different size circle. 
there. And he'd do it for, he, perhaps he would do it for the watch, the circle on the watch. And he spent hours doing this and um, found this really um, exciting, interesting thing to do. And was constantly looking out for circular things. Um, and one day, one of his parents said to him um, that there is something, uh, an instrument, which actually can give you all sorts of different circles of different sizes. And, the, and uh, he, he just couldn't believe this. He thought, this is, must be wonderful. And he was so excited. And they said, well, we'll buy you one. Oh, wonderful. So he, for your birthday. His birthday was three weeks later. He had to wait you know, for three weeks, waiting for this wonderful, wonderful thing, this magical thing that he was going to be given. And on his birthday, what was he given? A compass. And of course, his parents were quite right. They hadn't lied. It did give him an indefinite number of circles of all the sizes you can get. If you had a larger pair of compasses, give him even more. Um, so they hadn't been lying. But he was horribly disappointed. Horribly disappointed. It just seemed so boring to him, you know, as a thing. I mean, yes, he got all these circles of different sizes, but um, it wasn't what he'd been looking for. Of course, he didn't know what he'd been looking for. <laughs> he thought he was looking for something magic, had no idea of the sort of magic he was looking for. And of course, there was nothing magical about the compass, and that was why he was so disappointed. Now, later on, of course, because he was uh, a mathematically minded child who grew into a professional mathematician, engineer, later on, uh, he was able to see, as I'm sure everybody in this room can see, um, that there is a wonder. We want to call it magic, but there is certainly a wonder about the compass. The mathematical principle, you know, the notion of a circle, and what a circle just in general is, and the way in which a compass uh, exploits its physical possibilities to give you all sorts of circles of different sizes. I mean, we understand that. So it's not that there was nothing to wonder at in the compass. The point is he wasn't yet sufficiently mature to see that. And the sort of wonder which he had been looking for, the sort of magic that he'd been looking for, wasn't there. And so he was very disappointed and until he got uh, older and had a better mathematical understanding, um, he just had no wonder at all associated with circles anymore. Uh, and that can happen in science too. I think it's fair to say that um, for some people, Darwinism seems to have that effect. Now, it certainly doesn't have to. Because, I mean, certainly Darwinism banishes the utter, bewildered astonishment which one initially experiences when you look at you know, the living world and you look at the amazing adaptations that we see. Or not the thought thinking of them as adaptations, well, maybe thinking of them as very convenient things for that organism to have. But you, know, you, you look at the range of flowers and you look at the uh, different animals and so on and so forth. And frankly, you've got to be brain dead if you don't feel astonishment and wonder at that. Quite extraordinary. Um, and of course, part of that, uh, a large part initially, um, and certainly in historical terms, a large part of that wonder was having no idea how it could possibly have happened. There must be a hugely intelligent designer who had designed these things. Um, there must be. Just let me tell you an astonishing fact. When Charles Darwin came as an undergraduate to Cambridge and uh, went to, uh, was it Christ College, his college? Um, he was assigned a room like any undergraduate is. He was just assigned it. And he got the room, actually, which William Paley had had. 
years before. I think that's a wonderful historical irony. Anyway, um, later on, when Darwin was older, his theory certainly um, put paid to Paley's arguments about intelligent design and so on. Um, and certainly speaking for myself, and I think for many, many, many other people, still one is astonished by the results of biological evolution, of Darwinist evolution. Uh, still one is, uh, one wonders at it. Um, but no, we no longer, if we uh, accept the Darwinist theory, we now understand in general terms, and for some individual details in particular, detailed terms, but in general terms, we understand how it is possible for things like those to have evolved, and things like these, to have evolved. And in that sense, the argument uh, from design, I mean, as whether Aquinas put it, and, and Paley too, of course, um, that I think, that argument uh, has lost its strength. I would say it's completely lost its strength unless you come from the sort of theological background which makes explicit claims about the origin of living things and the diversity of living things, which do actually explicitly conflict with um, the Darwinian worldview, as indeed fundamentalist Christians who accept the literal truth of the book of Genesis do. So, yes, for some uh, theologians, for some theologians, um, there is a clear conflict between um, Darwinian theory and their religious approach, and um, they cannot allow it to be taught. Or, if it is taught, it must be taught just as, as a theory, um, which actually, they will say, um, is not true, and we don't have to believe it. So, yes, there are such cases. Um, but in general, unless, I think, unless you have the sort of theology with respect to this particular question, you know, the origin of, of living things and so forth, and their differences and... Uh, and extraordinary different designs and functional designs. Um, unless you come from that sort of very, very literalist theolo uh, theological tradition, um, your theology, your religion is not uh, undermined by biological Darwinian science, okay? Um, the astonishment may have gone, but the wonder is still there. It's not like the compass. Uh, and the relevance here of AI is that just as um, in Aquinas' time, in Paley's time, um, the existence of these apparently wonderfully designed living things was a mystery, a wonder. So the existence of the mind and the nature of the mind was a mystery um, and a wonder. And as I said, um, on the Cartesian view, um, it was, seemed to be clear, um, empirically speaking, it seemed to be clear that there was some close relationship between the mind and the brain. But um, philosophically speaking, and for that matter, scientifically speaking, um, the nature of that relationship was a, a complete mystery, and uh, indeed, uh, Descartes said at some points actually a metaphysical impossibility, which couldn't happen to possibly have happened unless God specifically made it happen and made it so. So the so-called mind-body problem was um, a horrendously difficult problem arising out of a uh, 
puzzlement about a wonderful aspect of the world, namely human minds and consciousness, um, which I would say didn't begin, didn't even begin to be uh, solved, didn't have important light thrown upon it um, until the middle of the 20th century. It was that long. And I suppose you might say from the philosophical point of view, I think the first people who really started to help us to see what was going on here were the sort of 1960s functionalists who were also very influential in cognitive science and um, early cognitive science, who broadly speaking said, the mind is what the brain does. The mind, if you want to think about the mind, it isn't a special substance, a special thing. Certainly it wasn't anything comparable to um, a sort of substantive soul. Or, um, but it wasn't the brain as such either. It wasn't to be thought of as the brain as such. It was to be thought of as what the brain does, the functions that the brain was fulfilling. Now, those functions were normally described in psychological terms by those people. Um, and they didn't use the notion of an information processor. Well, at least they used it, but they didn't put it in those terms. But the early AI people, who of course were starting their work at much the same, well, slightly earlier actually, anyway, much the same time, they did. And this is what I think AI has given us, which I think is hugely valuable, which has given us a way of interpreting that notion that the mind is what the brain does by saying the mind is an information processing system, a system which has to be described not in physical terms, but in abstract terms of information processing, computation of various sorts, which is implemented in the brain. A computer scientist, I think, would say, or could say, should say, the mind is the virtual machine. And again, I'm you know, standing on Ron's head here largely because he's one of the people who's written most interestingly about this. The mind is the virtual machine, or more accurately, the collection of very different and interacting virtual machines, which is implemented in the human brain, and whose information processing enables all of the sorts of behavior which we can show, all of the thoughts that we can think, and the uh, fears that we can entertain, and for that matter, although it, this is um, <laughs> much more um, philosophically difficult, I think, to um, explain, even on this view, a consciousness. I mean, there's no question whatsoever that, of course, that consciousness is, in some sense, uh, implementing the brain, caused by the brain, and Descartes himself said so. I mean, he didn't know which bits of the brain it was and what they were doing, but he said, you know, every time we have a, a, a different sort of conscious thought, there is something going on in the brain. And indeed, him saying, and he said, uh, people ought to be looking for it. And they started to look for it. That was started uh, neuroscience in the terms of neurophysiology uh, regarding the brain. And so, and now, of course, we have all these other sorts of gizmos, these image processing, image following, um, and... Uh, neural activity recording machines which can um, tell us, a, which are telling us a very great deal about what's going on in the brain. The, um, the complexity of it is absolutely huge and we still understand very, very little of it. But my view would be to say that, of course that work's necessary if you want to under, can understand consciousness, but to say, to be able to say what is going on 
when we experience a certain sort of consciousness is not the same thing, it seems to me, as to uh, explain in a philosophically satisfactory way what that consciousness is. And I say that very much from you know, somebody who is looking, happy to look at these things from the scientific worldview, um, but I, I'm not fully convinced by it, although I think it's the way we should be going, but I'm not fully convinced by it. And of course, if you're coming from a sort of theological background, which put, which I was going to say puts its faith in, <laughs> which is which states believes in the existence of some sort of substantive mind or soul, which is somehow you believe not only different from the brain in the sense that I've been saying. <coughs> that the mind is different from the brain, but in a stronger sense than that. That's what I was trying to signal with my word substantive there. If you believe, like the people that Gilbert Ryle was um, criticizing, if you believe that the mind or soul is such a phenomenon, deeply mysteriously connected to the brain, clearly, but not at all the same thing, um, then I think that certainly you'll be even more skeptical about the sort of view of consciousness that I've just sketched <laughs> horribly briefly than I am myself. And similarly, of course, because as I've said, this view of consciousness, broadly speaking, is what's come out of AI, what AI has given us. And of course, when I say AI has given it to us, it's not just that AI has given us a way, a sort of philosophically respectable way of talking about the mind, which we didn't have before. It's all also given us a huge range of concepts and it's constantly giving us more. A huge range of computational concepts of various sorts, which can be applied in thinking about specifically how certain sorts of thought can happen, certain sorts of behavior can happen. Just as Darwinist biology now, although Darwin himself couldn't, but Darwinist biology now can give us a lot of examples of highly detailed examples of just how biological evolution can happen and has happened, okay? Something that Darwin could only gesture at because he didn't have, you know, prior to modern genetics and, and so on. Um, so AI has not just given us a broad philosophical view, it's given us a whole host of very, very useful um, computational concepts, which not only are, can be clearly defined, uh, but can be, if you like, tested, so to speak, put into a computer and see what they get the computer to do. Now, um, so if you say that a certain sort of reasoning, for example, can be caused by this sort of information processing going on, and you put that into a computer, into an actual computer and switch the thing on, and what it does is something quite different, it shows you that you weren't right. It you cannot have been right, because it gives you different results from the ones that you expected to get. Now, if it gives you the sorts of results you had expected to get, which appear, uh, at least up to a point, to match um, what the psychologists um, tell us about um, psychologists, not physiologists, tell us um, about human thought. Well, that's very interesting and very encouraging. Of course, it doesn't prove it. You still need further um, empirical studies, which sometimes will include studies of the brain, things going on in the brain, to see. So AI can't give you all the, can't possibly 
give you alone all the answers about human thought, all the answers about the human mind. It can't do that. But it does give you a hugely helpful and, imp and um, important um, sort of starting point. Um, and so, so it's taught us, and it's still teaching us, obviously, it's taught us some fairly specific detailed things about our thoughts and behavior and arguably, possibly even our consciousness. Um, but if you ask me what is the most important thing that AI has done for us, it certainly isn't the gizmos. I mean, you may have recently gone on a foreign holiday um, and you've gone to a country whose language you don't understand, but there, you know, there are notices all around you, you don't know, and you put it into Google Translate and so, well, fine, I mean, great, you know, lovely, yeah. Uh, but in the uh, general scheme of things, and certainly in any sort of theological context, it's sort of trivial, I mean, it's useful, it's trivial. That is not the most important thing about AI, not the gizmos, hugely important and influential in our society, and not always in good ways, of course. Hence, again, a lot of the excitement and worry that you find expressed all around you at the moment in the press and media and so on, other media. But no, I would say the most important thing that AI has done for us or has given us is to enable us to understand what nobody understood before, certainly at the theoretical level and philosophical level, enabled us to appreciate the enormous complexity, subtlety, and power of the human mind, of what it is that the brain is doing, described in information processing terms. Um, and this was something, I mean, the subtlety of our thinking, of our memory, for example, was something that was intuitively grasped, I would say, by Freud, although I, his attempt to explain it no matter. Intuitively grasped by Freud, certainly intuitively grasped by great novelist Henry James, for example. Uh, but it certainly wasn't grasped by the experimental psychologists, by the psychologists. Um, they had far too simplistic a notion of how to begin to think about the mind. Um, and AI has, as I said, has taught us that the mind is hugely more uh, impressive, hugely more wondrous, and awe-inspiring um, than we ever realized. And again, if you come from a theological background which celebrates the human being, which celebrates, um, well, of course, they wouldn't say homo sapiens, wouldn't put it that way, but anyway, which celebrates homo sapiens, which, for example, talks about man in the image of God and that sort of language, but if you come from that sort of theological background, then I suppose you could say, up to a point, that AI gives you some extra ground to stand on, because it certainly is not, AI is not telling us, as many people argue, AI is not telling us, oh, we're just machines. We're nothing but machines, so, you know. Um, it's true it's telling us there's no magic. It's true it's telling us we are, in principle, systems that can be understood by some sort of science, but it's got to have computation in there. Neuroscience is not going to be enough. And insofar as neuroscience is relevant, it's got to be a computationally informed neuroscience. Um, but it's not saying we are just machines in the sense that that phrase is usually used. Because when people, 
uh, use that phrase, they're normally thinking of um, machines of a very different nature, even if they may be very impressive, you know, like an uh, internal combustion engine, or for that matter, a, a, a fancy typewriter. I mean, and not, not one that's got computer chips in it, but, you know, pre-computing things. Um, even those, apparently, very complex and very challenging and, again, wondrous. I come back to the notion of wonder. Wondrous things which human beings have in, had invented over the years, they are, in principle, intelligible. And um, because they are, in, no, not sorry, they're not just in principle intelligible, they are relatively easy to understand. Um, I mean, even I, who am absolutely useless with machines of any sort, I mean, <laughs> wrong can uh, bear witness to that, I am totally used with any sort of machine except possibly a sewing machine. If I put my mind to it, I could understand how a bicycle works. And the reason partly is, of course, I, it's, it's not because I understand the physics of it, you know, the Newtonian physics of it, because I don't, but I could if I wanted to. I could push myself, couldn't push myself to quantum physics, but I could push myself to that. And you can see how it works, which is partly why I can understand the showing a machine, because you can see the bits. Now, of course, those sorts of machine, therefore, are not impressive. You may be impressed by the ingenuity of the engineer who designed them, yes. But the actual machine is easy to understand. And people, when they say just machines, they're thinking about that sort of machine. But the point is a computer, and in particular, the sorts of um, computer systems which are uh, now being developed in AI and have been for many years, is a machine of a very, very, very different uh, degree of awesomeness. So if you want to keep in your worldview, whether it's for theological reasons or not, if you want to keep in your worldview that human beings are in some sense special, not magical, but special, very worthy of wonder, amazement, but capable in the end of understanding, then uh, AI gives you <coughs> um, a, a way of doing that, which won't, I suggest, uh, lead to the sort of disappointment which Oliver Selfridge uh, experienced on his birthday when he was given the compass. So, we're more harmonization than conflict, I think, here, in terms of the distinctions that Mark Harris was drawing. Cambridge Muslim College, training the next generation of Muslim thinkers.